Hi, Robert here with what I believe is one of my most explosive episodes on the observation deck to date. The complete fabrication of modern history. This episode covers the phantom reality we call history. Following the works of Russian mathematician Fomenko and others, I dug deeper into his assertions rather than take it on face value since we need more than a single source to base any reasonable conclusions on. So I went further into the rabbit hole we have been told is history. What I found astounded and angered me. The blatant lies, the deletion, distortion and wholesale depiction of history as we have been told is in fact a deception of global proportions even I had not anticipated. Beyond Fomenko's work, there are layers of lies, whole centuries of created bloodlines and the stealing not just of our heritage, but of the fabricated land deeds that saw the nobility and the church steal the lands that actually fed us. Come with me now on a journey that will, I am sure, leave you in no doubt we have been lied to on a scale of truly historical proportions. See you on the other side. Hi, and welcome to this episode on our fabricated history. There is so much to cover, so let's jump straight in with an introduction to Anatoly Fomenko and work our way through various aspects to build the case for a phantom history that will haunt your mind. So first, who is Fomenko? And why should we listen to him? Let's pop over to his resume and see if we can have some faith in what this man had to say. So here we are on the Wikipedia page, otherwise known as the fairy tale land of facts, talking about Anatoly Fomenko. And as you can see here, that Anatoly, born 13th, 1945 in Stalino, USSR, is a Soviet and Rus Russian mathematician. He's also a professor at Moscow State University and well known as a topologist and a member of the Russian Academy of Sciences. And now, obviously, Wikipedia attacks straight away with their linguistics, saying he is the author of pseudo-scientific theory known as the New Chronology. And as you will see throughout of this whole episode, pseudo-scientific is not a name I would use in order to describe this great man's work. But as you can see there, they attack him straight away. But this pseudo-scientific word they've given him almost immediately denotes, and he, he, here's what I'm trying to get across here. His publications, they've been accepted. I'm not going to go and list all of Fomenko's publications. You can see them down here for yourself. But he talks about things like Fomenko's modern geometry, methods and applications, Springer Verlag. And uh, let's have a look. Algebra and uh, symmetric spaces, Gordon Breach, 87. I'm not even going to be able to pronounce some of the stuff that Fomenko is capable of doing. Differential Geometry and Topography, Plinium Publishing Corporation, and that's in the USA. Geometry and Mechanics, publishers in the Netherlands, Taylors and France, Mechanics and Physics, Methods and Applications in Geometry, the Basic Elements of Differential Geometry and Topography in the Netherlands. He's also been published in the American Mathematical Society. So you can see this guy's got a pretty solid resume. Systems in advance for Soviet mathematics. And he was, he's also won numerous awards. When you're in line with what the establishment wants you to agree with or you agree with the establishment, it's called a publication. Okay, and you can see the qualifications of this guy. When you step out of line and start coming up with stuff that sits against this established view, you have now got pseudo-historical publications. So they've jumped back on. So he's not only now pseudo-scientific, and yet wasn't pseudo-scientific when he wrote all these papers, but if they disagree, he's now pseudo-historical and pseudo-scientific. So you can see a pattern here. For those of you who've watched my previous videos, I've already gone through this type of language that Wikipedia and lots of other skeptical sites use when it comes up against learned 
people, not conspiracy theories, learned academics who do not agree with the established point of view. So let's move on. So let me put some real perspective to Fomenko while I show you some of his chronology in pictorial format. Then we will take a brief look at what he and his colleagues claim after exhaustive research that got the establishment more than a little annoyed. So let's just run down this so-called pseudo-scientific man's achievements. Born in 1945, he was a member of the Russian Academy of Science, a member of the Russian Academy of Natural Sciences and a member of the International Academy of Science of Higher School. He's also a member of the Academy of Technological Sciences of Russian Federation, Doctor of Physical Mathematical Sciences, Professor, the Head of the Department of Differential Geometry and Applications of the Faculty of Mathematics and Mechanics of the Moscow State Lomonos University. He solved a well-known plateau problem in the theory of spectral minimal surfaces, created a theory of thin classification of integrable Hamiltonian dynamical systems, award winner of the state prize of the Russian Federation of 1996 in the field of mathematics for a series of works on the theory of invariance in the manifolds of Hamiltonian dynamical systems. The author of over 250 scientific works, 24 monographs and textbooks, specialist in the field of geometry and topology, calculus of variations, theory of minimal services, simplistic topology, Hamiltonian geometry and mechanics, computer geometry, the author of several books on the development and application of new empirical statistical methods for the analysis of historical chronicles, the chronology of ancient time and the Middle Ages. I think it's safe to assume Fomenko has what it takes to calculate the chronology he states is accurate, and yet he is undermined not because of his ability as a great mathematician, but because of his willingness to question the established narrative. Let's be honest, given this guy's qualifications, he would give Einstein a run for his money. So where did the current timeline that so many historians stick to come from? Well, it will not surprise you to know from a man much less learned than Fomenko's qualifications, but I'll give credit where he's due, he was also a clever and biased writer. His name was Joseph Justus Scaliger. And to read his entry on Wiki, there is no mention of pseudo-scientific estimates, when in reality the guy simply guessed without any source reference material of any description to original texts, but hey, Let's take a look at what we have to thank him for. So here's the guy responsible in most part for our current historical chronology, Joseph Justice Scaliger. Born August 1540, was a French religious leader and scholar known for expanding the notion of classical history from Greek and ancient Roman history to include Persian, Babylonian, Jewish and ancient Egyptian history. He spent the last 16 years of his life in the Netherlands. His academic output, and I'm just not, I'm not going to read all of it, but at, um, I just want to go to the bits where it's salient. It was reserved for his edition of Balanus in 1579 and his De Atonium Temporum to revolutionise perceived ideas of ancient chronology to show that ancient history is not confined to that of the Greeks and Romans but also comprised of the Persians, the Babylonians and the Egyptians hitherto neglected and that the Jews hitherto treated as a thing apart and that the historical narratives and fragments of each of these and their several systems of chronology must be critically compared. It was his commentary on the Malinus is really a treatise on ancient astronomy and it forms an introduction to the Temporum in his work Scaliger investigates ancient systems of determining epochs, calendars and where are we? computations of time. Applying the work of Copernicus and other modern scientists he reveals the principle behind these systems. In the remaining 24 years of his life, he expanded his work on the... I'm not even going to attempt it. He succeeded in reconstructing... OK, the guy, the guy reconstructed the Lost Chronicles of Eusebius, one of the most valuable ancient documents. Well, it wasn't an ancient document because he wrote it. 
So anyway, especially valuable for ancient chronology. So this guy collected a load of stuff that was copies of copies and is now valuable for ancient chronology. This he printed in 1606 in his Theosaurus Temporum, which in which he collected, restored and arranged every chronological relic extant in Greek or Latin. But remember, these chronological relics were copies of copies. There were no original sources to this guy's writing. It goes on to say, His pungent sarcasm soon reached the ears of persons who were its object, and his pen was not less bitter than his tongue. He was conscious of his power and not always sufficiently cautious or sufficiently gentle in its exercise. And, nor was he always right. He trusted much to his memory, which was occasionally treacherous. Well, if he trusted that much to his memory and it was occasionally treacherous, how on earth are we especially valuable for ancient chronology to believe that line as well? So we know from this actual entry itself that the guy was wrong on many occasions and yet at the same time. And notice that there's no pseudo-scientific, pseudo-historical to this guy. He just read books, copied them and then put them into revolutionise the perceived ideas of ancient chronology. The science of arranging events in their order of occurrence in time considered, for example, the use of a timeline or sequence of events. It is also the determination of the actual temporal sequence of past events. But when you don't have any source material and you've only got the Greek and Romans writing stuff down and you're copying it, how could it possibly be valuable for ancient chronology. Anyway, this is the guy we've all got to thank for the current, and this includes the dynastic Egyptian lines of ancient Egyptian history. This guy here is the one. And by the way, he did most of this to prove the fact that he was a prince as well. It's further on down here, which was never actually proven. So he died a normal citizen, as it were, without being crowned the prince he thought he was. Let's move on. So who are we to believe at this stage? Fomenko with his academic approach and the mind of a computer? Or a medieval guy with a grudge who, as you have seen, was wrong on many occasions, making copies from copies since there was no original source material? All our so-called ancient documents were written hundreds if not thousands of years after the events that they reported took place. At this point, it's also important to understand that prior to our modern and fake dating system, there were no actual years, as we know it, involved in most people's lives. Calculations were based on the length of time a king, emperor or queen ruled. So if you were stopped in the street and asked your birthday, you would not be able to tell them, especially if you were a lower class citizen. But you would be able to say, I was born in the seventh year of our king's rule. In fact, it was more focused on the day people died rather than their birthday, as we have today, and only then if you were of notable standing in society. So when the fabricated chroniclers create this pseudo-reality, all they had to go on was the word of mouth of stories of how long a king or queen lived, and you will see in many of them were made up to give the culture a more ancient past in order to establish cultural roots and give the public the idea their country had prevailed for much longer than it actually had. So what does Fomenko actually have to say about history in general? Given the sheer size of this man's work, it would be impossible to cover all of it here. But a few conclusions, I will give you a taste of the explosive calculations he worked out over a six-year period with his colleagues. For those of you who wish to experience the full works of his research, I found an audio compilation of them. And they are lengthy, be warned. But if you just want to sit back and listen to them, I will leave a link to all of them in the description below. I have also uploaded the first full volume to my website library as a PDF for those who wish to download it, read it. But be warned, it's over 600 pages long. So here are some of Fomenko's conclusions in brief. Firstly, 
that different accounts of the same historical events are often assigned different dates and locations by historians and translators, creating multiple phantom copies of these events. And these phantom copies are often misdated by centuries or even millennia and end up incorporated into conventional chronology. In other words, they are cut, copying and pasting the same events with slight changes in the narrative. Uh, today we call that plagiarism. Secondly, he states that this chronology was largely manufactured by Joseph Justice Scalinger. Oh, he's got that guy down to a nail like we did. In Opus Novum de Temporum in 1583 and in the Theosorum Temporum in 1606 and represents a vast array of dates produced without any justification whatsoever containing the repeating sequences of dates which shift equal to multiples of the major Kabbalistic numbers of 333 and 36. Oh, you recall we looked at Scallywag's work based on nothing more than the conjecture driven by his religious beliefs and not a single source copy and no mention of Wikipedia saying that this guy was pseudo history. So it's quite interesting in that. And even uh, Fomenko has picked up on uh, Scaliger's writings, Scaliger's writings. Thirdly, the archaeological dating or dendrochronological dating or paleographical dating, numismatic dating, carbon dating and other methods of dating of ancient sources and artefacts known today are erroneous, non-exact or dependent on traditional chronology. That their use in conjunction as confirming one another is a statistical fallacy. Probabilities cannot be added. In other words, carbon dating is based on nothing more than the phantom dates to begin with and seeks to confirm itself while using those baseless dates. Point five that Fomenko makes that I've chosen to uh, tell you here is that there is not a single document in existence today that can be reliably dated earlier than the 11th century. That most ancient artefacts may find other than consensual explanation. This is an important note. There are no documents earlier than the 11th century. Therefore, all so-called ancient manuscripts are Xerox copies of copies of hearsay. Well, simply fabricated. There is no source material. Point five that Fomenko makes, that the histories of ancient Rome, Greece and Egypt were crafted during the Renaissance by humanists and clergy, mostly on the basis of documents of their own making. And uh, I guess you can see the definition of BS in the English dictionary when it comes to that one. Number six, that the Old Testament is a rendition of events of the 14th to 16th centuries AD in Europe and Byzantium, containing prophecies about future events related in the New Testament, which is a rendition of events in 1153 to 1186 AD, according to Fomenko. Seven, that the Algamist of Claudius Ptolemy, traditionally dated to around 150 AD and considered to be the cornerstone of classical history, was compiled in the 16th and 17th centuries from astronomical data of the 9th to 16th centuries, since the alignments do not add up at the claimed period. Fomenko states that 37 complete Egyptian horoscopes found in Dendera and Esda and other temples have unique valid astronomical solutions with dates ranging from 1000 AD up to as late as the 1700s and again we see evidence of alignments dating from far later in artifacts which have been given artificially older dates. And two more snippets from Fomenko's book. That the book of Revelations we know of contains a horoscope that is dated the 25th to the 10th of October 1486 compiled by Kabbalist Jonathan Zretulin, who another servant of the church, as was his father, who happened to be the head monk at his local town, which produced many of these historical documents. And the last one I'll mention in Fomenko's work is that the Chinese tables of eclipses are more or less useless for dating, as they contain far too many eclipses that simply did not take place. The list of revelations in Fomenko's seminal work continues, but I am sure you get the point. History, as we know it, is a fabrication. As I said at the start, we should not take Fomenko's work on its own, although it is, in my opinion, pretty solid. 
But then we don't have to look too far to find another notable figure from history who also had a serious problem with the historical timeline. Our first stop is with Sir Isaac Newton. He too had a major problem with the chroniclers of his time. Isaac Newton's Chronology of Ancient Kingdoms Amended, published in 1728, one year after the great man's death, unleashed a storm of controversy. And for good reason. The book represents a drastically revised timeline for ancient civilizations, contradicting Greek history by 500 years and Egypt he contracted by over a thousand. Newton and the Origin of Civilization tells the story of how one of the most celebrated figures in the history of mathematics and of how his radical ideas produced an uproar that reverberated in Europe's learned circles throughout the 18th century and beyond. The majority of his treatise, however, is in the form of six chapters that explore the history of specific civilizations, and the chapters are entitled Of the Chronology of the First Ages of the Greek, the Empire of Egypt, the Assyrian Empire, the two contemporary empires of the Babylonians and Mendes, the description of the Temple of Solomon, and of the Empire of the Persians. It cannot be stressed enough that Newton was a learned man and, like Fomenko, a consummate mathematician and was not prone to speculation but rather than investigation. But, as you would expect, the world's wiki paint this particular work, and I quote, a foray into the occult rather than a scientific study as was all his other works ex accepted for, which were perfectly accepted. I will leave a link in the description below to Sir Isaac Newton's full works on the chronology of Ancient Kingdoms Amended, 1728, for those of you who want to have a look at it on the Gutenberg Press, or there's a great uh, website called uh, Newton Project at Oxford University, which you can download the complete works there. So I'll leave that in the description. I want to bring to your attention two more learned scholars which add weight to the claims of Fomenko and Newton, as if they were not enough in themselves. It is, I believe, important to see a common thread running through the minds of those who, from the earliest times, questions what was then the mainstream narrative, and mostly a narrative forged by the Benedictine monks who claimed they were copying from older texts, when in fact they were simply making things up to consolidate the church's view of the world. The idea of chronologies, different from the conventional chronology, can be traced back to at least the early 17th century and a man called Jean Hardouin. He then suggested that many ancient historical documents were much younger than commonly believed to be. In 1685, he published a version of Pliny the Elder's Natural History, in which he claimed that most of Greek and Roman text had been forged by Benedictine monks. Let's take a look at Hardouin and what, was he, and what he had to say prior to Newton's own observations. So here is Mr. Jean Hardouin, and uh, he was born in 1646 on the 3rd of September and died in 1729. Now, I'm not going to read all of this and bore you to death. I just want to get to the salient points. Um, and I rather like this, this entry here. Hardwin was appointed by the ecclesiastical authorities to supervise the Concordium Collectio Regina Maxima in 1715. But, and this is the bit I like, he was accused of suppressing important documents and including apocryphal ones. Now, I interpret that. Remember, he's working for the ecclesiastical authorities. Um, I interpret this as I'm not putting that rubbish in there. You made that stuff up. So he just didn't want to do it. And he got really uh, in, in a lot of trouble about it. And by order of the Parliament of Paris, then in conflict with the Jesuits, the publication of the work was delayed. And then this next paragraph, he says, it is, however, as the originator of a variety of his, here we go again with those derogatory comments, eccentric theories that Hardwin is now best remembered. The most remarkable contained the Chronology ex Numis Antiquitus Restutiae in 1696. I'm not even going to try that one, but it's scriptorum. Was to the effect that, with the exception of the works of Homer, Herodotus and Cicero, I'm sorry, uh, with the exception of Herodotus, that guy couldn't even get the size of the pyramid correct. And if you'd have looked at my previous video, you'd know all about this guy. He didn't know his 
butt end from his elbow. But let's just move on. The natural history of Pliny, blah, 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 and the satires of the Epistes of Horace. He claimed, this is Hardwin, that all the ancient classics of Greece and Rome were spurious, having been manufactured by the monks of the 13th century under the direction of a certain Severus Acronontius, by whom he might have meant Frederick the second. There he is. The guy was making all this stuff up. He denied the genuineness of most ancient works of art, coins and inscriptions and declared that the New Testament was originally written in Latin as he understood with good reasoning in his sort of work, which appeared in the year end 1729 and was translated by Edwin Johnson and published by August and Robinson in 1909 with a note for blah blah blah. But the point being is that Jean Hardwin also questioned all of the ancient classic Greeks of Rome were spurious, having been manufactured by months of the th monks of the 13th century under direction of Frederick II. And what is important to note is all of those mentioned so far not only state clearly history is a lie, but those deceptive monks are the source of much of what we are told today. And yet again, if you do not tow the church's party line of the time, you get attacked with prose such as this. So again, here we are, Hardwin's theory of universal forgery. He is notoriously a pathological case. Founding of numismatics, that's the study of coins for, you, for some of you, he found contradictions between coins and the literary text and slowly reached the conclusion that all ancient text had been forged by a gang of Italians in the late 14th century. He even identified the leader of the gang, who, as we know, was Frederick II, accordingly. I'm not going to read through all of this, but every single one of these paint this guy as a lunatic. And if he didn't pull the, the, the party line, that's exactly as you've seen in both with Fomenko and Newton. Up until they start saying things out of turn, then they get attacked whether it be subtly. I mean, this, they just go straight for the throat here. He's notoriously a pathological case. You can't say more than that. Let's move on. For my last witness to historical forgery claims, I now turn to a man many of you may not know, but of no less than academic achievement and was held in high regard. His name was Edwin Johnson, MA, 1894 formerly Professor of Classical Literature in New College, South Hampstead, and author of Antiquita Mater, a study of Christian origins, the rise of Christendom, and others. Let's just pop over to a website and have a look at what he has to say. And here we are with our final witness to fake history, which is Edwin Johnson, 1984. As I say, Professor of Classical Literature, I've already mentioned that. So it goes on to say, why everyone should read this book. This 100-page book from 1894 shows that the Paul figure was a literary invention from the 1500s. The purportedly early church father writings were literary inventions of the 1500s. Eusebius' church history was written in the 1500s. The Gospels were written in the 1500s. No cathedrals are ancient. They are from the early part of the modern period, such as 1400. We don't know how many centuries actually lie between the time of Augustus Caesar and the modern era. The time of the Roman Empire is likely several centuries closer. The radical critic Hermann Dietering pointed out to you, Topper, that Johnson anticipates, and I can't make out that word, but Topper and the New Chronology. The New Chronology holds that the Dark Ages, the years 600 to 900, didn't actually exist. For example, the year 911 is the year 1614 relabeled with later historians projecting fantasy events into the phantom 300-year period that never existed. It's as though I claim there were 300 years between now and now and filled it with all sorts of literary inventions. Johnson goes even further, writing, It has been said that Greek letters were silenced in Italy during the period between seven, uh, 700 and 1400 of our chronology. In other words, the Greeks basically just stopped writing. The statement is really without meaning for this period because it's imaginary in the first place. U. Topper was amazed to discover the present book which made his own literary would be radical. 
He goes on to say, I surveyed many radical theories of Christian and religious origins, but this book is the most extreme paradigm shift in theory I've found. Most excited books putting forth a new earth-shattering theory are really pretty narrow, except in the great bulk of the received liberal critical paradigm, proposing to shift just a couple of aspects. Many of Johnson's points are revolutionary, even if some might turn out to need repositioning, such as in the light of the Nag Hammadi Library and the Dead Sea Scrolls. And for those of you still listening, please carry on doing so, because I will get to the Dead Sea Scrolls a little bit later, I can assure you. So Johnson, and all I can say is Johnson's got absolutely nothing to worry about, even after finding the Dead Sea Scrolls, as you will see. The point here is that even Johnson in 1894 preempted what Fomenko was saying in terms of when these histories were invented. So both of them came to the same conclusions, and I believe that is more than a coincidence. So that's four learned scholars, and I rest the case for the fact that we're living a lie as far as historical data is concerned. Let's get back to it. I could go deeper into other scholars who throughout the ages have supported Fomenko's results, but I think we have seen enough to know that much of what we are told now presents a strong case for it being faked. So, now that we have set the expert witnesses in a clear light, I now wish to turn our attention to what sort of evidence in this day and age can we find to substantiate these assertions. No matter what these learned men have said, up to this point, it's still hearsay. I admit it is a strong case against the established views, but if I am to convince you of the validity of such claims, then it behoves me to set before you evidence rather than testimonies of these men and to check to see if there is a precedence in the acts of forgery of these alleged medieval producers of fake history. First, I think it only fair we establish if monks were caught with their quills in the cookie jar of history. For that, we head over to a great medieval site and see what they got up to and just how far these people could go. OK, so here is the first of four examples on a website called Hoaxes. Dot org. And this is about De Situ Britannia. In 1747, word of a major new historical discovery reached England. Charles Bertram, a 24-year-old English teacher in Denmark, had found an ancient manuscript and accompanying map titled De Situ Britannia that detailed the layout of roads and settlements in Roman Britain. The material caused a buzz of excitement amongst antiquarians because it revealed numerous Roman landmarks whose existence had not been previously known and suggested the existence of an entire unknown Roman province. But in fact, the map and manuscript turned out to be one of the greatest forgeries of the century. The fraud be began when Bertram wrote to William Stukeley, and for those of you who don't know, William Stukeley, a famous British antiquarian. Here's William here. And the reason I know Stukeley's work very, very well is because I live right on top of where he's done most of his work. As you can see here, he had a significant influence on the later development of archaeology. Remember, he was an Anglican clergyman. Isn't it amazing that um, this influence on later development of archaeology always centred around monasteries, monks and the church? And as I've said on previous videos, archaeology was born from the fact that it wanted to prove the Bible rather than find absolute proof of previous civilizations. But that's William Stukeley, where he did uh, prehistoric monuments of Stonehenge and Avery in Wiltshire. And for those of you who've asked me to look at Stonehenge in the 19th century, just please take a note of William Stukeley's work and the, the date he was born, which is 1687 to 1765. And we've got Stonehenge here, which Stukeley did actually study. And take it from me, I live down the road from Stonehenge and I live only six miles from that 
which is Avebury in Wiltshire. Let's go back to... So the fraud began when he wrote to Stukeley because he knew he had influence, you see, and informing him of the existence of the manuscript and map. With encouragement from Stukeley, Bertram made a careful copy of the material and sent it to Stukeley. The original was never sent, and it was never seen. A little bit like the monk. Stukeley then published a monograph theorising that the map was the work of a 14th century monk, they get it again, from Westminster, named Richard of Sirencester. For over 100 years, this theory went unquestioned until the German historian Karl Vex discovered that much of the manuscript had been lifted from a variety of 16th century sources. And in 1866, B.R. Woodward and J.B.E. Mayer published a more thorough debunking of the map, revealing it to be based upon a mosaic of information collected from Caesar, Tacticus, Solinus, Camden and other authorities. My next example I rather enjoyed, I must admit, The Travels of Marco Polo. Marco Polo's famous description of the world was written around 1298. It was Polo's account for the many years he had spent in China. According to the book's prologue, Marco Polo first travelled to China in 1271 with his father. While in China, he met the great ruler Kublai Khan and so impressed him that the Khan made Marco his special emissary, spending him on, sending him on missions throughout the various far-flung provinces of China. Marco Poli, Polo finally returned to Venice with his family in 1295. He wrote the account of his travels in 1298 while imprisoned in Genoa. Marco Polo's book became enormously influential and served in Europe as one of the primary sources of information about the Orient for many centuries. Christopher Columbus, for instance, took the book with him on his fateful voyage to the Americas. I'm going to be covering Mr Columbus a little bit later. It also inspired a number of legends, such as the idea that Marco Polo brought the secrets of spaghetti and ice cream with him back from China. Brackets. He didn't. Some scholars now suspect, however, that Marco Polo never went to China. The argument for this case has been laid out by Frances Wood in her book, Did Marco Polo Go to China? That's an imaginary title. So, the basic argument against Marco Polo involves a set of telling omissions. First of all, no reference has ever been found in Chinese archives to an Italian visitor like Marco Polo. Despite the fact that China's bureaucrats kept numerous forms of documentation and recorded the presence of many other Westerners. If Marco Polo did really serve as a special embassy to the Great Khan, it seems unusual that his presence would never have been noted. Second of all, Polo's account omits many details about Chinese culture that seem very important to almost all later European travellers. For instance, Wood notes Polo's apparent failure to pick up even a few Chinese or Mongol place names in his 17-year stay in China, so he couldn't actually name a town. Nor does he ever mention the Chinese style of writing, despite the dramatic difference between Chinese script and the Roman alphabet. Marco Polo does not mention seeing woodblock printing, which was then unknown in Europe. And he never mentions the Chinese custom of drinking tea, also unknown at that time. Despite the fact that he discussed varieties of Chinese wine, he never mentions the practice of foot binding, even though this custom fascinated all other Europeans who travelled to China. And he never mentions the use of chopsticks. And finally, he fails to mention the Great Wall of China. So they don't even believe that Marco Polo went to China. So let's move on to the next example. So we now move over to Count de Armanac's Forge Papal Bull. Count Jean V. de Armanac, 1420-1473, was... The Count fell in love with his younger sister, Isabel, whom he affectionately called Maya Mia Costa, my own rib. She was said to be one of the great beauties of her time. He had two sons with her. What? After which he sought approval from the Pope to marry her. The Pope obviously refused. Undeterred, the Count bribed a papal official, Antonia de Alette, Bishop of Cambrai, to forge a papal bull allowing marriage. A few months later, the Count and his sister had a third child together, a daughter. The three children were known as the Bastards of Amanac. Isabel referred to them in public as her niece and nephews, which technically they were. 
When the Pope learned of what the Count had done, he excommunicated him. Eventually, the Count married another woman not actually related to him. Now, the point being here is that we've got a bishop here that's quite happy to take a backhander and forge some paperwork. And my final example here is the history of Crowland. And it's about a fight, basically, between Crowland Abbey, located deep in the Lincolnshire fens of England, and another abbey. The abbey dates back to the early 9th century, and for centuries monks lived a quiet, solitary existence there. Yeah, busy, busy photocopying, tending their crops and spending long hours in work, worship. But despite their devotion to solitude, the monks were not immune from the intrusions of the outside world. In particular, they had to guard against a steady stream of legal threats to the abbey property. These threats peaked during the early 15th century, so we're back in the same time frame, the 15th century, when a neighbouring abbey claimed a portion of Crowland's lands as their own, resulting in a case that was brought to court in 1413. And, to prove that case, they had stole claim to the abbey's lands. The Crowland monks presented the court with a volume known as Historia Crowlandiesis or History of Crowland. That was a string of historical land charters woven together into a general history of the abbey. The history and charters were accepted as legitimate, and the Crowland monks won their case, and the abbey, for the moment, was safe. It was only in the 19th century that historians began to realise that something about the history was fishy. Their first clue was the names. They noticed that the history referred to numerous places and historical figures using 14th century terms, even in passages that were supposedly written in the 10th century. As they studied the documents more closely, historians found even more discrepancies. For instance, it referred to monks who had allegedly studied at Oxford University in years before the university actually existed. It mentioned the construction of a triangular bridge in the 10th century, even though triangular bridges weren't invented until the 14th century. And finally, and most bizarrely, it credited the monks of the abbey with remarkable health, for according to the history of the monks, had regularly attained ripe old ages as 115, 142 and even 148. Either the history was a fraud, historians realised, or there was something very special in the water those monks were drinking. Historians decided it was a fraud. So there you go with our 14th, 15th century monks clearly having no problem against their own forging documents and forging history itself. So let us just rest the case there for the fact that we have now got empirical evidence that these little tinkers actually do forge an awful lot of historical documents and then sell them off as ancient. The Crowland fake documents gives a good insight into the fact that monks did not just forge documents but whole histories which, as per the claims of those I have previously mentioned, are clearly and without doubt substantiated. What is very concerning is there are a number of records pertaining to paid, f paid forgeries created by monks to rob people of their land, since it was a time when only the elite and religious leaders could read. When taken to what passed as a court then, the judges were always in favour of the documented evidence and found in favour of the fraudsters. Our next stop is to establish if we can locate an actual fraudulent historical fake fact that is familiar to everybody and pull it apart to reveal just how solid this famous historical event may or may not be. I was fortunate enough to locate the story of Pompeii. All we are looking for are inconsistencies in the narrative and due to the work of others, I might add, I was able to bring you some glaring mistakes. Just like the monks of Crowland, the Pompeii fraudsters made several embarrassing mistakes on that fateful day in 79 AD. Pompeii is a lie of truly historic proportions and one that persists to this day. A researcher whose actual name I could not find but did some great work on pointing out some of those major flaws in the accounts of this alleged historical event. And the YouTube channel Conspiracies Are Us has a longer video on the same kind of subject 
And again, I'll leave a link in the descriptions to a more detailed view of the Pompeii story below. So let's take a look at a few of the anomalies so we can establish the assertions of all those learned minds who still maintain, who still maintain that Pompeii was wiped out by Vesuvius in 79 AD. Let's take a closer look. So let's start our journey with Pompeii on what better channel than the uh, history.com. And here we go. It says here, this was updated on April 15th, 2019. Mount Vesuvius, a volcano near the Bay of Naples in Italy, is hundreds of thousands of years old and has erupted more than 50 times. Its most famous eruption took place in the year 79 AD when the volcano buried the ancient Roman city of Pompeii under a thick carpet of volcanic ash. Now, obviously, every single source agrees that it was 79 AD. And then it goes on to say, 2,000 people died and the city was abandoned for almost as many years, when a group of explorers rediscovered the site in 1748. And I'll just jump down to rediscovering Pompeii. Pompeii remained mostly untouched until 1748, when a group of explorers looking for ancient artifacts arrived in Campania and began to dig. Now, I'm going to jump over to Wikipedia just to make sure that we've got the correct date. And I've got, again, the rediscovery. Herculaneum was properly rediscovered in 1738 by workmen, etc., etc., etc. Excavations to find further remains discovering Pompeii in 1748. So keep that date in mind. And then if we jump over to this one, Pompeii was finally rediscovered in 1755 okay near enough give or take a few years and then the final one i just want to make sure that you're there is a reason behind this by the way here we go herculaneum was discovered in 1709 and a systematic excavation began there in 1738 work did not begin at pompeii until 1748 so it agrees 1748 and it wasn't until 1763 now this is important it wasn't until 1763 an inscription republicae republicae pompeianorum was found that actually identified the site as Pompeii. So up until 1763, no one had any idea that it was actually Pompeii. And it wasn't until that inscription was found, it was identified as such. So keep those dates in mind. 1763, they finally identified Pompeii. So keep both those important dates in mind. 79 AD, Pompeii was wiped off the map and not until 1748 was it found and then only after the inscription was found in 1763 which identified the site. Sounds a bit like finding a passport at the base of the Twin Towers. But there, anyway, so according to this information, we should not be able to locate any references to Pompeii between those dates because it was lost to history. And since, as it was stated, it was lost to history, we can have a look at some maps created between those dates just to check to make sure Pompeii is not mentioned. So here is our first example. Our first stop is the David Rumsey map collection. And in this particular map, it's a very well-respected cartographer called Abraham Ortelius. 1527 to 1598. Now this particular map is dated 1570. Now given the dates that we've seen previously, wasn't rediscovered remember until 1763, this map should not contain any references because remember it was lost to history. So let's have a little look around. So we've got uh, Vesuvius here. As you can see, Vesuvius Mons. But obviously, we're not going to find Pompeii because obviously 15th century maps, it's been lost to history. Oh, and here we have Pompeii. So it looks like the map makers knew exactly where Pompeii was, and yet the archaeologists didn't. So as far as I'm concerned, that's uh, strike one. Let's have a look to see if we can find any more. So we're now on a site called Herculaneum UK and it's got a collection of maps of the Herculaneum pictures of the area that we're interested in. And remembering, they, Pompeii was lost to history, so 
the maps themselves shouldn't have, as we've already seen, any reference because it was lost and not identified until 1763. So let's find one that's in that period we're looking for. So we've got one here that's 1514, Bay of Naples. And here we go, right in the middle, you can see there, Pomperium. All right, so perhaps the archaeologists should have checked the maps beforehand. That's strike two, by the way. Now let's pick another one, Bay of Naples, 1570. Again, let's have a look, see if we can find. There's Vesuvius. Oh, and Pomperia pops up yet again. In other words, there's an unbroken line of knowing exactly where Pompeii is, dating right back to the alleged date of AD 79. That's strike three. And since I'm English and I don't play baseball, I'm going to go for four and five as well. So let me have a look at, oh, 1603. This is just, so this is about 50 years rediscovered Pompeii. So this definitely shouldn't have it. It was lost to history. Oh dear, there it goes again. Pompeii. So yeah, those damned archaeologists should have actually checked the maps. It would have made life a lot easier for them because according to this, it wasn't lost to history whatsoever, wasn't rediscovered in 16, uh, 1763. No need to rediscover it because in 1603, Pompeii was actually still there. One of the images that I did locate, and I'm hoping it's on one of these, excuse me for a second while I find it. Okay, so I found the map in question that I wanted. This was 1708, so it's 50 years prior to finding Pompeii again because they lost it. But what I want to show you on this particular one is you can see Pompeii in the center here. And this map of the early uh, sort of 1706, I think, uh, 1708, sorry, clearly shows not only that we can see Pompeii, so you can see this, Pompeii is listed here, and like all the other towns in the area, it's got buildings, and this was done in the 17th century. So clearly, you know, <laughs> they knew exactly where it had, and I would doubt very much whether that would have been put on the map in the way it was, had everybody not known exactly where Pompeii was at the time. So although there's no such thing, I would call that a strike four and you're out. Many researchers, including myself, have an exact date for the real destruction of Pompeii, which is 1631. Not only can this be verified, but current academics also have indicated the need to re-evaluate this travesty of historical fakery. Let's have a quick look at a short report here. We are on chronologia.org and this is a very short, uh, that's all there is to it, but it shows you the maps that I'd shown you previously and asks the question. The fragments below are from the maps and it names them all. And they're basically saying, where is this town now and what's its present day name? Because it's clearly pointing to Pompeii. But what I found interesting was that in the article is discussed the very interesting problem of the dating of the famous Vesuvius eruption, which covered completely the town of Pompeii by a layer of volcanic ash and pumice stone. The author conducted extensive studies. He found and analysed important evidence about the eruption of Vesuvius in 1631 and about the destruction by this eruption of surrounding towns. In particular, he studied carefully and analysed the special features of the canal of Cain Sarno and its environment in Pompeii. I had the opportunity to follow the process of the research and the creation of the hypothesis described in the paper. Therefore, I am well familiar with the efforts of the author to gather and generalise the entire accessible essential information on the theme, especially information from the 16th and 17th century documents. This gives me the merit to assess that the article features of the Domenico, Fontana's water conduit, the canal of Count Serrano, and the date of Pompeii destruction by Andreas Cirillo presents to the reader a hypothesis based on authentic evidence and facts that the eruption of Vesuvius in 1631 is namely that famous eruption, which covered the town of Pompeii by a layer of volcanic ash and pumice stone, a hypothesis which should be thoroughly verified in the future. 
In accordance with this, I would recommend the scientists and people interested in the archaeology of Pompeii to read the article of Cicillo, featuring uh, features of the Domenico Fontana's water conduit and the date of the Pompeii destruction. Now, that was written by Jordan Taboff, Department of Application of Information Technologies in the Humanities at the Institute of Mathematics and Informatics, the Bulgarian Academy Sciences. Now we'll find out why 1631 keeps popping up. So what evidence supports this date of 1631? Well, for one, we know that cartographers knew exactly where Pompeii was. So that not discovered until they found the passport. Sorry, I meant inscription in 1763 we know now is simply not true but listed in every modern text the destruction of pompeii in 1631 is actually commemorated on a memorial plaque at the Farawan manila villa on the road to naples as you can see in these images it lists pompeii on line 27 as one of the victims of the eruption now, how can this be when A, it was lost to history, as you recall, and B, it was supposed to have happened in 79 AD? How could they list a town that was not to be discovered for approximately another 120 years or so? Even the academics on the specific archaeological Pompeii blog are raising questions. Have a look at the site here. As you can see, this is exactly about blogging Pompeii and it says a blog for all those who work on Pompeii and the other archaeological sites of the Bay of Naples. So this is an academic blog and I'm not going to go through half of the stuff that they've got on here. But this lists obviously written in Latin the details of what was written on the plaques that I showed you that listed Pompeii. And one of the archaeologists here, it says, Unfortunately, the excellent monograph of Anelio Lagalla and Armado Patillo doesn't explain the 23rd line of this inscription, where the list of damaged cities, along with the quite preposterous Resina Portillo, contains... Pompeii in big letters and Herculaneum, the cities that supposedly had disappeared almost 2,000 years ago, exclamation mark. This is an archaeologist shouting about what the hell is Pompeii and Herculaneum doing on a list that's, that's talking about a 1633 Eruption. Uh, well, it was actually 1631, but uh, it's an archaeologist, so you've got to give him some leeway. It gets even better because the same person who posted that Pompeii was on line 23 with Herculaneum, they then go on to cite this eyewitness of the 1633, as it's called here, an eyewitness of the eruption wrote this. Everything on the way was swept away by this storm and the fire. Whirl socks and flocks were drawn and scattered around. Fields, woods, huts, houses and towers were destroyed and thrown about. Two of these fire flows were very quick. One of them vigorously ran down to Herculaneum. The other ran to Pompeii. The cities once recovered from the ashes remember he's 1633 once recovered from the ashes i do not know if they will be alive again after the 1633 he's talking about and about herculaneum and pompeii this is how i call both the ancient city and the one next to it i will tell you a little bit later then he explains what to tell you about pompeii now, on the contrary, it was not only horrified by the roar in Bitcoin Vesuvius, but it was buried without splendid burial procession under the ashes, and there was probably not even one eyewitness of this misery left from the city of Annunciate. It is called now, and such a great disaster did not happen during Nero, when the city was damaged by an earthquake... And when, during a theatrical performance, a casual argument between Nucerians and Pomperians became the reason for a bloody wrangle, first with stones and then with knives. And now the Pompeii itself looks really miserable. This is an eyewitness account of the 1633 destruction of Pompeii. Now, what I find almost uh, just as interesting is this is an archaeological 
blog and yet this was posted back in 2010 and look at this no archaeologist has got the balls to reply to any of this information that this what I can perceive as an honest blogging archaeologist has written here absolute silence is that a surprise but aren't we excited to actually get an eyewitness account of the 1633 Pompeii eruption and not 79 AD so we have maps that should not have known where Pompeii was we have memorials in towns that shouldn't have been there and eyewitness accounts of Pompeii being burned in 1633 or 31 and not 79 AD as we are taught. As if that wasn't enough to convince you, here are just two more fun facts that do not fit with the stories we are being told. We move to some of the paintings or frescoes said to be inside these perfectly preserved homes of Pompeii, which gave us an insight to Roman art of the first century, such as the world has never seen. Let's take a look at just two of them. The first is a mosaic of some food, not very exciting unless you take a closer look at the detail. Imagine for a moment we have the correct date of 1631 for the Pompeii disaster and keep the 1631 date fixed in your mind. Now, let's pop over to good old Chris Slave Trader Columbus and see what else this guy was noted for having brought back to Europe. So here we are on one of my favourite sites of facts and fables, Wikipedia. Now, the reason I'm here on Wikipedia, as some of you already know, is I don't think we need to worry too much about a pineapple. And what I want to show you is the history of the pineapple. It's a very interesting history. Bear with me on this one. I mentioned Chris Slave Trader Columbus. Well, down here in history, buried amongst all this, you can actually see here. OK, Columbus encountered the pineapple in 1493 on the leeward island of Guadalupe. He called it Pina de Indes, meaning Pine of the Indians. And Chris Columbus brought it back to him with Spain, thus making the pineapple the first bromelade to be introduced by humans outside of the New Worlds. The point being is there were no pineapples in Europe prior to to 1493 so he was the first Chris Columbus to be introduced by humans outside the new world there is the wonderful history of the pineapple now let's get back to that wonderful first century Roman fresco so as we take a look at this fresco from first century Rome or should I say 79 AD Pompeii you can see, and I'm sure some of you have already seen it up there in the top right hand corner, we are looking at a pineapple. And of course, this would not have been possible since it did not arrive in Europe until 1493 when Columbus brought it back. But it would make perfect sense if in fact Pompeii was raised to the ground in 1631 because it would have had approximately 200, 140 years of being known in that region. But certainly you should not be looking at a pineapple in 79 AD. Strike five. The image you see is a famous one that was found within Pompeii. It's called the Three Graces. This excavated fresco of the Roman civilization of the first century AD, depicting the Three Graces from Pompeii, now sits in Naples Archaeological Museum. So this is another fine example of a first century fresco. The second image you're now seeing is the painting by Raphael, whose painting you may recognize here, Oil on Canvas by Raphael of the Three Graces, painted between 1503 and 1505, housed in the Musée Condé of Chantilly, France. So, putting both of these paintings side by side, we have a 1st century fresco and a 15th century painting almost identical to each other. What are the odds? 
It would in fact make more sense that the three graces in Pompeii were installed after Raphael's painting, giving the artist, or restoration expert, enough time to have seen it. And it makes more logic to have done this between 1505, when Raphael painted it, and installed in Pompeii prior to the 1631 eruption. This would also fit with the fresco of the fruit bowl and the pineapple perfectly. And it tells us two things. First, the whole of modern Pompeii construction is faked. And Pompeii was a living, breathing, working city and was still installing artwork based on what was known at the time in the years immediately prior to the 1631 eruption. Pompeii was not destroyed in AD 79. The facts, not speculation, refute this in so many ways. Let me wrap up Pompeii with a final nail in the coffin of fake history. The image you are looking at is the result of a Second World War bombings in Pompeii. According to the records, the Allies had to treat Pompeii as a military site since the Germans had stored vast amounts of munitions there. Let's have a quick look at the damage caused by Operation Avalanche. We are now on a site, as you can see here, the bombings of Pompeii 1943. It's actually a German site, but I've already run Google Translator for you. I'm not going to read all of it for you because it is a quite an in-depth view of it. But Operation Avalanche in 19, 10th of September 1943. And again, I'm not going to bore you with all the details. Here's, here's the uh, bottom line. Over two days of bombing, the images that you see before you are all that was left of Pompeii. And as the Allied forces stated at the time, 163 bombs were dropped on Pompeii because it was thought there were weapon stores for Germans. And then again, it lists the two days of bombing. Further down, there is article that appeared on November 9th, 1943 in the Times, listing the devastation in Pompeii. There is one crater in the arena of the amphitheater and several near misses. The wall of the gladiators training school was hit in three places. There is a crater in the eastern wall of the Via del Abadanza, to which incomplete excavations had prevented further damage. The house of Rex Tiberinus and Tribius Valens were hit. The Senecoli and house of Ipidus Rufus were destroyed. The house used for restoration north of the Via degli Augusti and the adjoining house were destroyed. The temple of Jupiter on the western side of the Forum was hit the Temple of Apollo, the House of Triptolemus, north of the Via Marina, were badly damaged. The museum is now in ruins. The officer, who reported this by the way, was told that two bombs had fallen on the Temple of Hercules in Region 8 and that the House of Salus and Panza in Region 6 also had direct hits. The whole article goes into great detail of the bombing of the area but as you can see here the devastation to Pompeii was quite extensive. After the war many of the structures were rebuilt with the help of American and British team of experts. The renovation of Pompeii started in 1944 and continued for more than 15 years. So what exactly are visitors looking at when they go to Pompeii? A reconstruction? a fake town rebuilt after the war, and yet we are told those frescoes are authentic. I suggest Pompeii is nothing more than a fictitious theme park based on fabricated fiction sold as fact. As for those famous bodies frozen in time, they too are nothing more than plaster casts created from a set of voids found in the lava and used as plaster photocopies to reproduce the same body shapes over and over again. And that, viewers, we know is a fact. I will leave an interesting link in the description below so you can read the plaster cast fakes written by historian Mary Beard, who is the Professor of Classics at Cambridge University. One thing we can be certain of as we continue our journey through the fairy tale of history 
is that Pompeii forms just one of a long list of misrepresentations of history sold as a factual event, which, given the evidence of maps, out-of-place items in frescoes, memorial plaques naming Pompeii in 1631, and subsequent destruction by bombs, reveal an ongoing deception of truly historic proportions. I think we have established the act of rewriting history is alive and well in our era, and Fomenko's work, which calculated the thousand years using his mathematical mind, could be supported yet again with a much simpler set of observations. I'm going to give you a quick insight into what is not Roman numerals, since it has importance and relevance to our ongoing journey. Both the letters I and J from our alphabet play a vital role in our next stage. So, what is so important about these particular letters? Well, if you spend as long as I do looking at old maps, documents and coins, you get to know that the I and J is used on many of them. The problem is, it has been mistaken for the number one, which it most certainly is not. If anything, the use of I or J is sometimes used to denote the end or terminus of a number, but never the start, as you can see here. Here we are on a site covering genealogy and family history, and someone else asked the same question about, in this case, just the letter J, but it also applies to the letter I, and he was saying that he was puzzled about why they keep appearing. But as you can see in this Roman text, it always appears at the end of the number. The answer to the poster's question was, and you can see it here, was used for the final to make it clear that the number had ended. And it goes on about printing Roman numerals of prescriptions. So it was used also, and it still is, in a lot of cases for uh, pharmacy prescriptions. But again, it, it repeats it here. This is to signify that it is terminal. In other words, it is the end of the number. That's all I wanted to cover with you, just to make sure we've got that reference here. And as you will see, it is of high importance in the next section. So why is this so important? Well, it is of critical importance since when these letters were used, and you have to remember the mass population could not read or write and simply took the word of those who could, which is why you recall monks spent some of their time creating fake documents for cash favours or power. The letters used on many old maps clearly show the use of these letters as you'll see in these examples. But what you've got to understand is why put them in front, not at the end, of the remaining numbers? This is a question that has perplexed many researchers and to be honest with you they've yet to come up with a solid reason behind the use. However, Given the now established faking of our historical timeline, I personally believe it was a sort of fail-safe method to be used by the powers at the time in planning the manipulation of history. So when the time came to switch it to a number and thus adding a thousand years of fake history, it was an easy transition since the masses knew no better and would take little note of it, and both letters could easily be mistaken for the number one. And for the scholars amongst you, it may be difficult to believe such a crazy notion. So to that end, here are a few more examples of letters rather than a simple number one being used on certain documents and coins. Moreover, there are maps and documents that show clearly the use of both the letter I, J and the number one within the same document, supporting the idea there was a difference in the use within the same documents. Fomenko calculated approximately the same amount of time without noting the use of the I or J in documents, which I believe supports both aspects of his and this area of investigation, as you will see. To support this hypothesis, I'm going to show you what I believe is a set of examples which do not use the I or J and, in my opinion, were precursors to adding a thousand years of phantom time. The small selection I took from a post located on the website Stolen History, so I'm not going to take credit for this discovery, but it shows some great detective work by the original poster. 
In order to clarify this additional thousand years, we go to an old German book on archive.org and see if we can compare those entries within that book with what mainstream media has to say about those same people in history. In addition, I'll use a small list of entries in a document format with hyperlinks so we can jump straight to the wiki page which matches the entry so we can assess the difference in the detail, if any. So, let us begin. So here we are, and let me just explain what you're looking at. On the left-hand side, we're on archive.org with the original German book. On the right hand side, you can see a small list and that's all it is. It's just a small list of translations taken from this book to read in English just to make things a little easier. And what we're going to do is we're going to follow the right hand side list here as far as page numbers and entries are concerned in the German book here. And then I'm going to hit the hyperlink so we should fire up Wikipedia and see what they have to say up against the information that we have taken from this book. Now, one thing I wanna make absolutely clear at this point is remember that I mentioned the I and the J. Well, in this book, you can clearly see they know how to use the number one. And when they need to use the number one, as you can see quite clearly here, they use it. Now, that might seem a bit of an obvious statement to make, but all will be clear in a few moments. So just to explain, this book is basically a list or an entry of nobility births in Europe given whatever year that they've listed them in. So just to make a point there, it's the nobility births across Europe at the time of publication. So we're going to start with our first entry, which lists page 15, and it says it's the first entry. Now it's page 15 of the book, not page 15 of archive.org. So we will jump, now we're on page 16, so we'll just go back one. Obviously that makes it page 15. What we're looking for is this entry here. And as you can see straight away, it's right at the top. Okay, so you can actually see born 15th of August, 735. And you can see here that Friedrich Abernacht was born in 15th of August, 735. What we're going to do now is hit this hyperlink to check this guy out because after all he's going to have a listing and see what the details are. So we're firing up his, we can translate if we want, doesn't really make any difference. So here's Frederick, lovely picture of Prince Frederick, like I said it was the nobility, born according to the archived or of 735 and here we've got 17 35 so there's a thousand years that have been added to this particular entry so now we work our way to the second entry which is page 21 so let me just jump to page 21 here as you can see and the first entry here is as you can see in English Rudolf Joseph Colorado and that's actually the first line Rudolf Joseph Colorado 6th of July the year 7 06 and here it's got the year 706 so what we're going to do is we're going to jump over to Rudolph's and we'll translate that and it's got the year 706 oh no it's got the year 1706 so they've added another thousand years to this chap our next entry is on page 31 of the book so let me just jump to page 31 for you good people 29 31. So page 31 we have the entry Captain First und Abt Horonus Freire von Roth von Schreckenstein or Schreckenstein born 19th of September 726 and if you look at here we've got the same entry at the top of the page September 19th 726 which matches with that and what we're going to do now again is we'll go over to see Schrockenstein born September 20th and they've added again 726 there's a number one has been dropped in the front of it adding another thousand years and now we turn to page 37 so let's just jump over to 37 
and it says in the bottom half. So we are now looking at the bottom half, as I said, is Pabst Pius VI from the house of Brashki, born on the 27th of December in the year 717, and the bottom half here, and here is the same guy, born on the 27th of December 717, so that's round here, that's Pius VI, so we've checked that. So let's check his entry in the halls of fame, as it were. And we bring up, here he is, the 6, get rid of the translation. And his date is 1717 as opposed to December 717. So we've got another thousand years added here as well. And our last example, and I can tell you that this book is full of them, but I think we've got a good enough sample. And it's a bit of a coincidence that we've, we seem to be spot on to a thousand years, which matches with Fomenko's work as well. But let's just carry on. Page 43, the first entry. So let's just go to 43. And the first entry here is August Frederick Geb. And on the first line here, well, let's have a look. Oh, oh, here we are. August Frederick Geb, born 19th of November in the year 754. Okay, born 19th of November in English, 754. So let's find out what this guy has to say. And just to clarify this entry, although you can see Carl Saxony Meningen, you can see here it's uh, Sachen or Menugen Hertz, but if you look underneath August Frederick, August Frederick, that's what, this is his real name, that was his title. And as you can see here, we know that he was 19th of November in the year 754, which we've got here. And if we have a look at here, we've got 1,700. And 54. So it's pretty obvious that when they need to write a number one, as you saw right at the beginning of this book, they will write a number one. But these dates supersede the fact that there are no number ones. I mean, look, here's a number one, 19th of October, 753. So why not use a one if it was applicable? Or maybe they've added a thousand years as they've done on every single page from these entries of our current historical records. As you saw there, at the very least, we have to ask why were the dates as we know them written down without using a one to denote what we are told is the correct year, when clearly the number one is used in many other parts of the same document. As with the ones I showed you in the map, why use the letter I or J at the beginning of a number rather than use the number one. As far as I'm concerned, Fomenko, Newton and many others seem to have calculated similar discrepancies and the examples I showed you would back those calculations and raises some pretty damning questions about historical manipulation. We need to understand that there are no written records that date back further than the 11th century. And what we have today are copies of copies of copies. And since all of known or allegedly known historical accounts rely on nothing more than the musings of the Greeks, the fakes of the monks and the fraudsters of fake rulers to fill in the gaps, what is it we're exactly left with? And if you thought the pursuit of fake and old documents was a thing of the past, you would be wrong. Most of what we see today claimed as authentic documents of ancient scribes are nothing more than medieval forgeries, just as Fomenko states. From the pineapples of Pompeii to the manufactured fakes of monks, history has been created to control the hearts and minds, to misdirect us all into believing in a fabricated world of conflict and division based on nothing more than a phantom history plagiarised, copied and sold as facts. Before I give you my last two examples of historical deceptions, please take the time to support my work by liking, subscribing and sharing this information with anyone and everyone. And for the price of a cup of coffee, you can help keep this channel going via PayPal, Patreon and Bitcoin, all of which are in the description below. Or you can simply hit the PayPal button up on the banner there. With that being said, 
let me wrap up this episode with two parting examples and my conclusions. The first example is an easy one. It is said that the tradition of burying someone stems from around about the 7th century. The process of burial was firmly in the hands of the church and burying the dead was only allowed on the lands near a church, the so-called churchyard. Part of the churchyard used for burial was called the graveyard. Now, if you recall the book I showed you, which places those dates a thousand years before the wiki entries, then you may begin to see why I mention graveyards. Since, if we are to believe what is told to us, then someone somewhere should be able to find a grave which dates to the 7th, 8th or 9th centuries. But I doubt this will be the case. I suspect you will find nothing older than the same time period when those despicable monks and others were forging documents, which, if correct, makes it impossible to locate a date older than the late 14th to mid 15th centuries, and even then it may be quite a challenge. My last example is of the continuation of forgeries being used to back up even older forged text. A little like using argon argon dating from Pompeii as a means to accurately date everything else when in fact the original was faked itself. The practice of using fakes to support previous fakes has not gone away, as you can see here. So as reported on the CNN site here, Bible Museum says five of its Dead Sea Scrolls are fake. Museum Bible in Washington DC say five of its most valuable artifacts once thought to be part of the historic Dead Sea Scrolls are fake and will not be displayed anymore. German-based scholars tested the fragments and found that five show characteristics inconsistent with ancient origins and therefore will no longer be displayed in the museum. It goes on to say that now scholars say the Dead Sea forgeries could be part of the most significant sham in biblical archaeology since the Gospel of Jesus's wife. Some scholars estimate that as many as 70 forged fragments have hit the market since 2002. I'm sorry for laughing but it, as you can see this whole episode and they're still at it those and this time it's not the monks it's um, as it says further down here it's unscrupulous antiquities dealers that are preying on evangelical like the greens making millions in the process but what I found interesting about this as well is that Monday's revelations are not the first time the greens have courted controversy with their artifacts collection in 2017 the green family company Hobby Lobby agreed to pay three million dollars and return artifacts get this smuggled out of Iraq as part of a settlement justice department now I was always given to believe and the images would have you believe on Google that Al-Qaeda smashed up or ISIS smashed up the museums and looted it all and it's strange that it should actually end up at the Greens collection over in the States. So that's just one example. I'm not, it's quite a lengthy pour and I'm not going to go into it but suffice to say even when it comes to the Dead Sea Scrolls and there's a lot of money to be made they're still at it. Our last stop on this journey of historical hypocrisy is a site called Lying Pen. And you can see just how crazy the current situation is when distributing fake history to support fake history. Here we go. We finally arrived at our last stop of this particular lengthy episode, so I hope I've kept your attention. And it's called thelyingpen.com. Now, I'm not going to bore you anymore with all the details of each and every one of these entries. But as you can see, as I scroll down with you, a list of unprovenanced post-2002 Dead Sea Scroll-like fragments. And believe me, they go into some serious detail. Open seminars, they hold these all over the place. God's Library, Gabriel's Stone and Forger's Bookshelves on Dating, traf Faking and Trafficking. <laughs> A symposium so there's there's whole lectures on this area of modern fakery when it comes to biblical text troubling anomalies and elements that raise questions suspicions and concerns in Dead Sea Scroll fragments in the museum collection and it's not talking about the Greens Museum this is a completely different one by the way 
Then we're Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Dead Sea Scroll like fragments, number of lines, measurements and some images, preliminaries. These guys are literally going into detail about all of this. Museum of Bible written by the Warn Nibs, I like that name, the Warn Nibs an equal thickness of stroke scribe school. They're literally picking up a forensic look of this. Dead Sea Scroll like fragments and Bible study software, okay. I like this one. Open lecture by the author of Newsweek Journalist. Unholy businesses, a true tale of faith, greed and forgery in the Holy Land. And it goes on and on. So don't think for a second, and then we end up with the Lion Pen Conference at the bottom. But don't think for a second that those medieval forgeries have got any less now that we live in the modern era. So I would say that Fomenko, Newton and all of the contemporaries throughout history have got it pretty spot on. To conclude this episode, it is only fair I finish with just how utterly lost our history really is. We have seen the calculations of Fomenko, Newton and others. We have destroyed the idea that Pompeii was buried in 79 AD and along with the accuracy of Argon dating, it's all in ruins. I've presented evidence of a thousand years being added through documentation and thus confirming the suspicions of past and present scholars who have not sold their soul to the papal view of history. Remember, archaeology as a scientific discipline was, at its inception, nothing more than a way to prove the biblical texts, which we now know was faked in the first place. The bias that stemmed from those early theologians formed the basis of modern archaeology, and since we now know that most, if not all of it, was forged, where does it leave us? To make matters worse, we have to contend with a plethora of calendars used by different cultures over the millennia. The Mayans, the Chinese, the Julian calendar, the Gregorian calendar, and what about the Russian calendar, which, up until Peter the Great, was based on the creation of the world as stated in the Bible. On December the 20th, 1699, Russian Tsar Peter the Great issued an order for the new year to be celebrated on January the 1st, according to the Julian calendar, transferring Russia from the year 7208 into the year 1700, literally overnight. Before that, in Russia, this festival had been celebrated on September 1st, based on the ancient chronology from the creation of the world. Peter the Great admitted that this change was due to his passionate desire to lead the chronology and the countdown to the new year from the birth of Christ in line with European fashion. The bottom line is, no one knows what year it is. No one knows what history we had added or lost since this is clearly a fabricated reality that we are currently taught. It's either religious views, military conquests or rulers, ascensions or deaths. But then it begs the question, why are these historical bookmarks we are taught the only way to look upon our world? We are taught about wars, battles, assassinations, selective genocides, the discovery of new lands in a way which deliberately muffles the cries of those who are murdered so this new land could be conquered and sold to us as some sort of honourable empire building achievement. And then we speak of those empires as if they were a good thing rather than the invasions and mistreatment of the local population as they really were. For centuries, the nobles and the monasteries had total control over reading and writing, giving them a monopoly on what was sold as reality. And, as you've seen, it continues to this day. We all know about the great leader's assassination, Twin Towers and the World Wars. We could tell others about the Salem Witch Trials, the Inquisition and the Black Death. And that, my friends, is a sad indictment of our world view. My point is, we have been conditioned over eons to look upon history in a distorted way, a way that promotes negativity, evil and death, and yet we take not a single moment to consider the history of achievement without those acts of violence towards each other. I often wonder why we cannot look upon our ancestors with admiration for the inventive ways they made life wonderful. It is almost as if the goodness of mankind has been pushed to one side in favour of the evil that men do, and chronicled so we can only see how conflicted we have always been. And yet, I can't help wonder what was hidden from us, what achievements and harmony was in existence prior to the bookmarking of evil deeds and calling it history. 
The propaganda machines of the major film industries would have us believe that if an apocalyptic event occurred, we would all turn into savages and kill each other. Without the guidance from our leaders, we would quickly devolve into some sort of tribal lunatics ransacking and killing for food rather than get organised and actually help each other, which is our true nature. I doubt whether you will ever see a movie that shows how well we would do after we get rid of the evil that sits at the head of the table. And yet, this is how history is told to us. This is how it is perpetuated. And unless we decide to change our own point of view, it will be allowed to grow, creating more division and seeding the next generation to think exactly the same. And yet, I suspect these are the reasons our history has been distorted. It is because it would shake the current foundations of oppression if we were to see the light, if the harmony of our ancestors of a unified world that had advanced in many aspects of life were kept hidden from us had been enjoyed by us. It would fracture the mirror of lies and reveal a world we need not measure with pain and suffering but with admiration and hope. If we can only break the mental chains of how we see our own history, how we wish to view the potential of mankind without the conflict driven by the greed of a few, then I think we would have something to be proud of when the future generations look back and realise it was we who made that change. That change. I hope you have enjoyed and found this episode of the Observation Deck, however long, interesting and I hope inspiring in some sort of way. But don't be angry over what's been done. Get positive about what you need to do next. And please remember to support and share with anyone and everyone. So, until next time, question everything, believe nothing, and stay curious. See you on the other side.